Um, and if we want to think about pioneering change, I can't think of anybody better to invite to start us off in thinking than that than our first speaker, Candice Immerson from the Nuffield Trust. Candice is the Director of Policy at the Nuffield Trust, where she leads a programme of work on new models of care, including many of the issues being discussed at our conference over the next few days, at the place of technology, the challenge and opportunities related to workforce, for example. Her previous work with the King's Fund focused on community health services, workforce planning and future healthcare trends. And she's held key strategic and policy roles within the Department of Health, including leading a workforce modernisation initiative. So things that are very much going to feature in our programme this week. So it really is a privilege to welcome Candice um, to, to set the scene for our deliberations for the, for the week ahead with her opening dress, address, hashtag YGP, should it be hashtag Y primary care? Thank you, Candice. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for inviting me here. It feels an enormous um, privilege to speak to you guys because I will have read much of what you produce and value it hugely. So I hope I sort of um, pay appropriate testament to it. So why GP should it be why primary care? Um, YGP came about because of the pressures faced by primary care and the challenges faced in recruiting adequate numbers of GPs to um, this incredibly important role. And I think some of those challenges sort of eloquently put by David Oliver in a recent BMJ blog primary care engine room of the NHS underpins its equity, efficiency and access, but it's underfunded, understaffed and <coughs> overstretched by rising demand. And, uh, yeah. and I probably hardly need tell you the very significant growing evidence of that pressure, BMA surveys highlighting it, and indeed the work that the King's Fund just did recently, looking and analysing GP data, all tell us the significance of this. But what really brought it home to me was this letter. It's a letter sent to my parents by their local practice, sent to every um, person registered with them. It described the loss of local GPs, the loss of their much-valued local community hospital. It talks in depth about the lack of GPs in their local training pipeline. They're in an area that is struggling to attract people. And it's so sad that primary care that was once the jewel in the crown of the NHS and was a popular career for young daughters, doctors has gone into such apparent terminal decline we will continue to provide what we believe is the most effective form of primary care with continuity of care provided by a well-trained GP who will take responsibility for your care. It is a difficult job that is probably going to get more difficult. And I've put the line at the bottom that currently, if you want to see a particular GP, you are lucky to see them within four weeks. In fact, I think a friend of my parents, it was six weeks recently. So that for me, really brought home the reality of something that statistics, I think, don't perhaps convey. But clearly, this is therefore a time in which we need the fundamental aspiration of YGP to be there, very visible. It was an attempt to create what um, Dominic called an island of positivity in a sea of negativity. And actually, if you go on to Twitter and read the entries under the YGP hashtag, they are extraordinary in their eloquence and power, in the way that they describe the really positive things of being a general practitioner, serving patients, and what it means to be. I mean, I loved this description here, capturing the humanity of the role of, of a GP and how incredibly that wonderful dynamic at its best between GP and patient, the very, very rich and rewarding dynamic for anyone who's lucky enough to be part of it. And these are more um, entries that you find there. And the, um, this on the list, uh, on the left um, there was um, the, the 
tweet link, link to a blog that captured these points. And they are a very powerful list of why anyone would want to be a GP. But I am struck reading them that a number of those points are under challenge. So managing it, not being managed, you're in charge of your working day. I wonder whether people feel that a move to primary care at scale is a threat to that particular piece. Job satisfaction in the continuity and personal nature of the care you provide, does that feel like it's under threat too? It certainly felt like it was under threat in that letter that my parents received. So that's our challenge. We have to hold on to these incredibly important and positive things, but how can we do it in the face of what is very, very real? And somebody who I really appreciate in the way that they've talked about this is Thomas Bodenheimer from the United States. And he um, coined the phrase, as you'll know, quadruple aim, really recognising how incredibly important it is to recognise the staffing issues alongside the patient issues in our healthcare systems. And he, in this very good article, talks about some of the ways in which you might challenge um, and address these, what we clearly have very visibly within primary care at the moment in this country are all those risks that you see on the left-hand side. So we absolutely need to be thinking about the way in which we might use some of the strategies that he talks about on the right-hand side. And one thing I'm going to particularly talk about is the use of other um, members of staff within the team because it's something that I um, am particularly interested in. And so again, in another paper that he wrote, he talked to and helped us frame the opportunities for using other members of staff and said it isn't about a straight substitution of one person for another. Let's look more deeply at what it is that people do and then think creatively about who can take on some elements of that role. And these were some estimates that he came up with. You may debate them, but I think the fundamental point that actually we need to think in a very um, much richer way about how we might um, restart primary care is, is key. And something that really brought home the challenges and the sort of very bizarre approach that we have historically had to primary care. So in this slide, what you're seeing is an analysis that was done for the North West London Integrated Care Pilot, feeding back to GPs what their population was using by way of resource and in terms of activity. And it, if you look at this, you cannot but think, how bizarre is it that we have a construct that tries to meet this incredible diversity of challenge and need with a 10-minute consultation? It surely... Um, just doesn't stack up. And what is also striking in this is that the population that we absolutely perennially focus on, older people with multiple comorbidities, look at how relatively small they are in that whole piece. So as I said, I, for me, a really key part of the solution within um, uh, YGP supporting primary care for the future is thinking about the whole team in primary care. And I was exceptionally lucky to be on the commission that was looking at the future of primary care with uh, Professor Martin Rowland, who's here with us today. And you see up here, the right-hand side, our report. And we, very deliberately, the title was Creating Teams for Tomorrow. We felt very passionately that the team was a key to the sustainable solution within primary care. And a case study that we put in the report, which for me had huge resonance with some of the experience that we've had in the NHS, was the case study from Group Health in America, where they had tried the advanced access, driving people to do much more with their time, giving productivity incentives for doctors, and lo and behold, while they did get more activity, what they found was that doctors were burnt out and actually A&E visits rose. So for the whole health system, this was a very counterproductive intervention. And so they remodelled their care and they did deconstruct it and they did deconstruct some of the roles. They did pay attention to continuity of care and they 
arranged it so that doctors focused on those that really needed their deep um, decision making and diagnostic capacity and then used other members of staff for more routine and other tasks and um, very positively both patients and staff benefited from this and actually A&E visits fell. And another really good summation of some of the things that one might do to address this very real crisis actually came in a response to David's um, blog in the BMJ when I felt that this captured absolutely beautifully the huge and rich dimension of things that we're going to need to think about if we're going to address the challenge. We absolutely need to think about the working lives of doctors and finding ways to help people manage their time better. We've got to think about the workforce, a new community and primary care workforce, and we do need more segmented models of care that appropriately respond to that great diversity of need that I showed in my earlier slide, and supportive systems and processes. And crucially, I would add to that the role that new technology will bring, which I'll come on to later. Now, a way that I have helped myself sort of frame some of the opportunities around skill mix is to sort of think of healthcare in a way where you have um, perhaps complexity. I, every time I use this, I, it's perhaps not the right word, but the sort of the more um, needing for high technical interventions on the left, where you have relatively small numbers um, going out with larger numbers and, and less. Um, sort of perhaps because actually primary care does manage a lot of complexity within it. But crucially in this slide, what I've tried to lay out are the huge ranges of things that one might do within that space to help better manage patients. So a more diverse skill mix that I think actually help us start to meet unmet needs within primary care. So um, therapists, pharmacists, paramedics, I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, the role of self-care, um, using pharmacy better. Um, greater use of support workers for care navigation, which is so important to patients. And, and that red circle there is something which um, Martin McShane has sort of previously called the, the capability gap that potentially exists between primary and secondary care. And it's certainly true that there are many areas where primary care requires greater skills if it is going to take on the role that is expected of it increasingly around managing more complex patients in the community. And that's where, crucially, increased consultant support to GP um, via e-communications and other things is really critical. So for me, this sort of lays out the landscape of possibilities around using new staff. So I just wanted to pick up some of those examples. And the first of this comes from a case study that we had in um, the, the Future of Primary Care report. And it was a really striking experience going to the old school surgery in Bristol um, to see the, the wide range way in which pharmacists were being used within the practice um, with huge wins both for patients and for people within the practice. And, and one of the things that I haven't mentioned on this slide but really struck me that the, um, one of the pharmacists that they'd used there, and she was actually a partner in the practice now had taken on the role of quality improvement within the practice and was really driving that forward. And the whole practice felt like it was full of energy and optimism and a sense of this is something that we are on top of. And they were constantly, clearly, constantly had new um, ideas. And it was that energy from the redesign, from the new ways of working was something that struck me time and again um, as we went around to our, our pos more positive examples. Another example is the use of paramedic practitioners in primary care and there's been um, great success in using them in Whitstable. But what's really striking about this example is that their neighbouring CCG tried to use these paramedic practitioners and completely failed to get the um, scheme off the ground. And what they found was that essentially in the neighbouring CCG, the GPs there didn't trust the, pra the 
the paramedics to do the work properly and didn't refer them and so the scheme didn't get off. And that personal dimension of trust to these new roles is a really critical thing. I really like this quote. I, I wrote a report um, with other colleagues at the Nuffield Trust recently on reshaping the workforce and, and Mike's um, Haxby practice was one of our case studies within that. And I think his quote here about how these new roles are, are critical, he said they've taken the pressure out of the care service, complementing what we do as GPs beautifully, but ultimately the biggest benefit is that these roles are stabilising the service. Other people talk to me about, actually now I feel optimistic when I go into work, whereas I hadn't felt that, I'd actually felt very close um, to giving up. Extended nursing roles in primary care, well, I need hardly talk to you guys about this, you'll, you'll know um, the research much better than I, um, but it, clearly they are a really critical part. One of the things that struck us though very um, powerfully when um, we were doing the commission was um, how little support nurses can get within small practices, support for continuing professional development and training. And given they do offer huge opportunities for supporting patients better, giving them that um, investment is clearly absolutely critical. There's much talk about physicians' associates, and I think the opportunity that they offer to bring in some incredibly bright, very enthusiastic people within the workforce is absolutely great. What did come out from our case studies was that they do have significant challenges associated with them, not least of which is the fact that at the moment they can't prescribe, though I think that... Um, hopefully regulatory changes in the offing on that but they also crucially require quite a significant period of mentorship um, once they come into the practice which takes time and effort and that's something too that I think is a very real challenge for practices embarking on these changes bringing in these new roles they they don't come for free in terms of supervision and mentorship time I think an area that certainly within secondary care we're realising how um, incredibly important they can be and you've seen the um, apprenticeships and the associate nurse role but I'm sure there is further to go to within primary care and, and we talked about the sort of medical assistant type of role within the um, primary care commission report. Um, so I think there's, there's much to do there. And something that I'm constantly struck about is that if you bring in um, unskilled people from your, your local community, then actually that and help them develop and grow, then that is a huge benefit for the community too. This is um, a slide that actually my um, a friend and colleague, um, Professor Richard Bomer, often use it's Aurora Health in um, the US and he likes to ask the question how many GPs are there in this slide I think the answer is two um, and that is the sum total of, of GPs in that particular practice they use lots of health coaches to support their local population um, very successfully too though it is a, a carve out model so it's not a comprehensive model of primary care and I felt I couldn't um, go without reflecting on the fact there are more radical versions of this too. One of the practices that came across as having the strongest quality improvement culture that we visited um, for the uh, Primary Care Commission work was Cuckoo Lane, which is, of course, entirely nurse-led um, and uses um, GPs to support their nurse-led model and has a um, very high CQC rating as well. So if one was to lay out a vision of the future of primary care, of primary care that is sustainable in the face of all these challenges and changes, you would absolutely need to lay out a future where your general practice was integrated or certainly working incredibly closely with community care and public health. You would be population focused in what you're doing. MD, multidisciplinary working would be absolutely core. But crucially, with this emphasis on relationships and continuity of care, and that may need to be team continuity, but continuity 
is important. Again, as you will all know very well, the evidence for it speaks louder than much of the evidence that we have about what works. But there's this huge array of opportunities coming down the track with new technology. I know that new technology is not easy to implement. We have what we know as the productivity paradox, where technology gets introduced and often productivity can get worse before it gets better. But here in this country, we have primary care using electronic records way ahead of most people um, internationally. So we have a very strong platform to build on. Um, the key, though, is that that platform speaks and relates to the rest of the healthcare system and the rest of the healthcare system sort of catches up with primary care. So can we secure an island of positivity in this very difficult time? I think that if you do use a more diverse workforce effectively and you use technology, you absolutely can improve the quality of care for patients and the working lives of staff. But you must hold centre stage that need to hold on to the continuous healing relationships. And you need to address the gaps in the clinical workforce. We need more of anything. And one thing that worries me hugely is we're a bit fiddling while Rome burns at the moment around our workforce. There's lots of protestation about it, but are we really, really doing what is needed? Because as I need hardly tell this audience, if primary care fails and the NHS fails, then David talked about an engine room of the NHS. For me, it's the foundation. It's the absolute rock upon which the NHS is built. And at the moment, it's really under threat. Thank you. Many thanks, Candice, for a really um, a stimulating and thoughtful um, start to our conference. And I think raising the issues that are challenging us all at home in work and that we'll be touching on this week as well. We do have some time for some questions. So um, there's a couple of roving mics around that, um, that are going. So perhaps if people want to wave at me. Um, and we've got over here with Roger. Thank you. Uh, Roger Jones, editor of the British Journal of Gen <coughs> excuse me, General Practice. Thank you very much for a terrific presentation. Um, when the, the five-year forward view was published, there were kind of two choices about how things might develop. There was the multi-specialty community provider, which you really concentrated on. But there was also the primary and acute model, which offers opportunities theoretically for economies of scale in HR and procurement and estates and so on. And you haven't said anything about that. Where do you think that sits in your vision of the future in terms of r realistic joint working across the interface? So I think there is much by way of infrastructure that secondary care can offer primary care. So um, HR support, all the sort of back office functions um, could come out of secondary care. I am deeply sceptical of organisational solutions to um, pathway problems. Um, so uh, I... That may have been seen as an MCP model. Um, I absolutely um, buy, as I said, the, the integration of primary and community, but I, I was very deliberately not talking about organisational models. The experience in the US when um, hospitals took over local practices thinking they would get some of this synergy is, is many of them then divested. They found it a very different business that they were managing and didn't actually get the real synergy out of it. But in terms of infrastructure support, I mean, I, I'm a non-executive director in a large, very large acute trust, a billion pound turnover. And it has capabilities that people would but dream of. You know, they've got their microsystems improvement cavity. And that sort of function, I see, could be really supportive to the broader community and should be really supportive to the broader community. But I wouldn't see it being solved by taking over local practices personally. Thank you. Any other questions from the floor? Maybe while people are thinking, could I ask, we've, we've spent quite, uh, I mean, your, your point about are we, are we um, 
are we standing around while Rome burns? And, and one of the questions that as a community we've been thinking about is how to raise understanding of what primary care is. Mm -hmm. And that uh, certainly the differenti differentiation between general practice, whether that's as a, an organisational context or, or, the, or the professional practice. But, um, and, and primary care, or just an understanding of what primary care is at all as a, as a term that people know. And I just wonder what your thoughts on that, on how, whether we still need some work to do on raising understanding and how you think we might best do it. Um, absolutely, and there's very good evidence that um, people's exposure to an environment really determines whether they will then want to go um, and work there. So I think... And the other thing I'm very taken by is using opportunities to do shadowing across communities so that people really do get to understand each other's roles. Um, I'm always struck, certainly um, when people go out from secondary care and sit in primary care and sit alongside community nurses, they are amazed at the complexity of what it is that people are managing in the community and don't really have that understanding sort of intuitively. And how much do you think the, the public understand what oh, it is sorry. Like as well? Uh, no, yes, as well, I think yeah. two parts of the question. Really. So, um, well, except, I mean, the, the, the advantage you have with the public is that everyone, as you Seems said at the beginning, uses primary care whether they get the diversity of the hinterland that sits around it, then maybe, maybe not. Thank you. Question from Amanda. Amanda Howe from UEA. Thank you, oh, Candice. Hi, Amanda. Hello. <laughs> um, talking of the most effective short-term solutions, I mean, we know that it takes some time to train extra doctors, extra paramedics, extra nurses. One of the policies that some other countries have used is um, financial incentives. So, example for the, I think, 20, 25% of doctors who aren't sure which specialty they want to go into when they're signing up at FY2. If there was a, a sort of golden handshake model saying, if you come into GP now, you'll get a salary that you can take to practice of your choice with certain criteria and, you know, to work in the next two years, or even at ST3 level, so that people could commit to the GP workforce without a, you know, buying into a practice, and some of the more needy practices might be able to fill some seats at a table and support those young doctors to get used to working in the places where they might then stay. I'm wondering, as a policy analyst in general, whether you have a view about those sort of financial incentives. Other countries sometimes are making young doctors serve in the least popular places in return for some loan repayment or whatever. My impression is forcing often doesn't help, but I, I would appreciate your comment about, as a very expert analyst. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, it's certainly something in the paper that um, Richard Bomer and I wrote about the future of the workforce. We um, reflected on the fact that the NHS does have a one-size-fits-all approach to remuneration around medical staff, which did, um, and we felt that therefore there were opportunities to use financial incentives. And certainly I'm aware um, with rural healthcare that that can play a key part too. So I think it probably has to be part of the mix. The only counter to that um, is that we know that the evidence on financial incentives more generally um, is not great. There are much more fundamental things at play in terms of what rewards people within, within their work. But in terms of getting people through the door, it may well be a necessary part in you know, a much broader set of armory. I think one of the real risks is if you think, oh, well, we've sorted it then, you know, here's another 10 grand for working there and that really isn't going to work if you haven't fundamentally addressed some of the problems that created the issues in the first place. Thank you. Any other questions? And there's one at the front as well. Hi, I'm <coughs> Stuart Mercer, Director of the Scottish School of Primary Care. Uh, Scotland's embarking on a new GP contract, uh, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware of it. The, there's no longer any quaff, and GP practices will be working in clusters of practices. 
try and improve uh, quality on a, on a local basis. I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. Um, well, you may or may not be aware that Nuffield has just produced quite a positive <laughs> report about the experience in Scotland. And it certainly felt to me, as somebody who participated in the seminar that we, we ran up in Edinburgh that sort of kicked off that work, was that Scotland had, in a very fortunate way, got a lot of things that were running with the grain of people's own internal motivations. Um, but it, you still have the very real problems that sit around all of these issues, which is the lack of funding. And for my money, that has got to be addressed. It is an absolutely critical part of this. And there is only so much that creativity will, will take us and, and deal with in terms of the problems we face. Thanks, Candice. John? Uh, thank you very much, Candice. John Campbell uh, from Exeter. I hadn't come across the example of Cuckoo Lane. I was interested to, to, to see that, and that was a nurse-led uh, example that you, you, you put up for us. And I was interested, just looking at their website just now, that they have an outstanding CQC rating. An entirely nurse-led practice clearly offers potential at times when workforce is challenged, but it also surely is associated with risk. And I'm interested in the idea. Do you know anything? Can you give us any more detail about that? I mean, how many nurses? I, did I think you possibly said there was more than 20 nurses, but I'd be interested. <laughs> in the, 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 and you know, is that yeah. really is nurse substitution really got to that point? Because if, if it has, then I think that's a real challenge for us and potentially offers uh, an important solution. But it's a slightly surprising uh, case study. So don't forget, they didn't not use GPs. It's that, that nurses led the overall um, practice, but it certainly has worked. And of course, there are other examples around the country too. I mean, I'm looking at Martin, because I, can the, the, yes, Mike, get to him. I think there was a, there was a, we, in, <coughs> when we were doing our commission, we, we went to a number of places that we thought would be interesting to visit around the country, and Cuckoo Lane was one of them. And the thing that stuck out for me was, yes, it was nurse-led, and yes, there was a predominance of nurses as clinicians with a smaller number of salaried GPs employed. But the thing that really struck out for me was that it was an extraordinary pair of really charismatic nurses who were leading that, that venture. And wherever we went, we saw you know, a few people who were extraordinary people who were leading, you know, fantastic things going on in the NHS. They happened to be nurses in Cuckoo Lane. They happened to be GPs when we went down to the southwest. And that, that's what really struck out with the model of general practice we have. Really, if you can harness the entrepreneurialism uh, of people who are prepared to lead new interventions, then you can do striking things. Absolutely. And I think that that was what I was trying to get across, that, that sense of optimism, a, a desire and capacity to do the quality improvement was such a key part of, of an eventual successful outcome. Oh, Seth, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Christine Bond from the University of Aberdeen. I'm a pharmacist by training, although I've done all my academic work in a medical school. So I've long had an interest in developing the roles of other healthcare professionals. And there's Cochrane reviews that show that pharmacists can work well and get better outcomes. There have been pharmacists working in general practices for more than 20 years. Why is it that we haven't got to a more advanced position now with a diversified healthcare team? What are the barriers that we don't understand? Well, I think we mustn't underestimate <coughs> what a significant shift it is for staff who bring in these new roles. Again, I was struck from many of our examples is it really did take the burning platform before people would embrace them and it certainly is the history of much of role redesign is I'm afraid there is often significant professional reluctance, fear, sense of boundaries um, being transgressed so that needs to be recognised but I think what again is very striking um, is that if it works, and when it works, it can then be so positive. It can be part of a mutually reinforcing positive thing. Anyone else? 
I think that's been a fascinating discussion in really setting the, the context, as I've said, for the week. I mean, both reminding us about the importance of the people and, 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 the, and the roles in there, but actually again, in your diagram of, of, of actually we need to change the whole context in which things are um, happening. And maybe as a final question to leave us with to think for the week ahead. Um, there's obviously a lot of people involved in this because it's a very important problem. What do you think should be the priorities for us as an academic workforce, as an academic community, in, in helping to make this, this challenge happen and move forward? Um, I think we do crucially need um, more and better evidence about these more diverse um, workforce compositions that are coming about within um, primary care. I think we need a much, much deeper understanding of the work. So a key message from Richard and I with our work on skill mix was skill mix should follow work. So begin with the redesign of the work. But I'm not sure, and that was why for me the slide with showing the diversity of patient needs that primary care is meeting. Do we really, really understand that? Have we really got our heads around it? And primary care suffers so desperately because it doesn't have good routinely available data. And some, we've got some databases, but they're certainly not as, as easily accessible as others. So sort of arguing for the data that will help you then really understand the work. And then once we've really understood the work, then we can build what is needed to, to, to address that, that workforce challenge. Thank you. I think that's a challenge that many of us are, are involved in, but, but a real one for us to take away for the rest of the week. So can I invite us all to give a very warm thank you to Candice Emerson for joining us today. Thank you.